Good afternoon, um, everyone. So uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar for the Giant Cybersecurity Month. Um, my name is Davina Lauten. Um, I'm working for the Giant Project, and I will be your moderator for today. Um, so this is the second out of our four webinars for this year's uh, Cybersecurity Month campaign, uh, which is titled A Community of Cyber Heroes. Um, as you know, Cybersecurity Month is an initiative launched by ENISA, the European Agency for Cybersecurity. Um, so for those who are uh, maybe not familiar with Géant, uh, let me just give you a little uh, background. Um, so Géant is the organization that uh, delivers a worldwide network and a portfolio of services um, for the research and education community. Um, we also operate a pan-European e-infrastructure uh, network and we run a membership organ association um, for Europe's national research and education networks. Um, so the main objective of our Cybersecurity Month campaign is to increase the, the knowledge and the awareness of cybersecurity in the broader international research and education community. Um, and we want to provide our members and users with um, targeted and tailor-made content. Um, so for this year's campaign, we are focusing on four main target groups. Um, so last week was dedicated um, to decision makers. Um, then this week we are targeting cybersecurity professionals. Uh, we will continue next week with home workers. And then um, during the last week of October um, will be dedicated to students and researchers. Um, so the campaign also includes a program of uh, four webinars um, held by cybersecurity experts from the industry, but also from the Giant community. Um, and we are very happy to offer you also something new this year. Um, we welcome uh, the collaboration with Red Clara, uh, which is Géant's uh, counterpart organization for Latin America. And thanks to this collaboration, um, we are able to offer you a live interpretation um, of our webinars in three languages, um, English, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, so if you would like to follow today's presentation in uh, Spanish or Portuguese, um, you can just click on the globe icon in the Zoom control bar and um, select the language uh, you want to hear. Um, so for the, today's webinar, we welcome Klaus Muller from DFN CERT. Um, based on his experience within the German uh, Research and Education Network, um, he will give us today a short introduction to multi-factor authentication um, and some of the acronyms and standards that are used. Um, he will also cover use cases for multi-factor authentication and um, explain how to avoid some common pitfalls uh, when implementing MFA. Um, the webinar will last for approximately one hour, including a 15 minutes Q&A. Um, so we, if you have a question for Klaus, you can uh, either put it in the chat or you can also virtually raise your hands and then um, we will give you the floor. Um, so that's, um, that's the part for me for the introduction. And now I'm very happy to give the floor to uh, Klaus. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. I will start the sharing of my slides now. And as Davina has also introduced uh, what this talk is about, I can start right away. So today's topic is, as she said, multi-factor authentication with a bit of an emphasis on universities and research institutions as the applicants. We'll start with a small uh, introduction by defining what MFA is and why do we want to introduce MFA into our organizations and then uh, a bit talking about what uh, to do to get uh, the introduction right. So the acronym stands for multi-factor authentication. So let's take this uh, term apart uh, uh, word by word. Authentication means verifying that you are who you claim to be. So in, in my case, uh, when I claim to the computer that I am the user Klaus Möller or K Möller, the computer has to be somewhat sure that these are actually uh, the actions of Mr. Möller typing at the keyboard or moving the mouse or whatever he's doing there. So 
it's not to be confused with authorization, which is a very related concept that is verifying that you are, as a user, allowed to do what you want to do. For example, to write to a file or connect to the internet or whatever. There's also the uh, topic of authenticity, which is sometimes used uh, similar to, to authentication. It means verifying that something is what it claims to be. This is more uh, common in the case of banknotes, legal documents, and other paper things that uh, we need to uh, ensure that they are what they claim to be. So there are another related topics which we were not covering today as it would make the talk too long. This is a single sign on and federated authentication and authorization infrastructure. Uh, single sign on means just that the users have to sign on only once and uh, for the rest of their sessions, they won't be bothered with uh, authentication again. And federated uh, structures are about uh, dealing with the uh, persons that are authenticated already by another uh, institution and uh, just want to use some resources at your site, for example, a library or a high performance computer. MFA is often used in combination with these two things, but uh, it doesn't have to be. And it does not require any use of single sign on or federated authentication. So how does authentication work? Well, it usually means you tell the computer who you are. So you type in your username. And uh, in the most trusting case, the computer will not even require a password. It just believes what you say, which is the same thing as it just trusts you. So of course, this is not really secured as everybody could just claim to be you as long as they know your username. So we need a proof that you are really you and this is the authentication factor, the second term in MFA. So there are three kinds of authentication factors um, typically found in the literature. First one is knowledge. That means something that you know. These are in practice all the passwords, passphrases, pins, or even uh, cryptographic keys if we have to remember them from the top of our head, which is usually not the case. It's mostly often only a passphrase that unlocks these keys from a token or from an encrypted file. The good thing about authentication by knowledge is that it is very well understood. And also by the users, we use them every day. And uh, we all know what is meant when we get the prompt password or enter your PIN and uh, we know what to do. It's easy to implement, just a very small uh, thing to, to uh, add to your application to ask for a password. Cost is very low. It's commonplace, already built in everywhere. So that's the good side. The bad side is that it's also very well understood where the weaknesses are. And uh, of course, the adversaries do have this knowledge and exploit it. We'll come to this uh, in a moment. Second authentication factor is possession, something that you own can be things like a uniform, so you know that the guy from the police is actually from the police, or they have a badge that sh shows that they belong to your company, ID cards, even tokens. This can be a USB token, a smart card, um, can be a, a NFC token for near-field communication. But these would also be all the keyless entry systems you might have in your car and things like that. The good thing is that access to these tokens can be somewhat restricted, at least in principle. It cannot be trivially copied and uh, a loss of these 
can be detected easily as long as you think about it and think of your home keys. Uh, well, at least by the end of the day, when you try to enter your home again, you will find that you've uh, lost or left them somewhere else. The downside is they can be lost or stolen or even shared, meaning I can give them to others, which is in some use cases even wanted uh, to do be the case. Um, they need physical replacement if they are lost, damaged, stolen or otherwise compromised. And that also means they have a certain cost attached to them because uh, these things uh, aren't for free. So the third factor is inherence, which is a bit harder to grasp. This is something that you are, meaning these can be things like how you look like, for think of face recognition software or just uh, your photo on your photo ID card, your fingerprint, your retina patterns, your voice patterns, or whatever else you may come up with. Um, the good thing about inheritance is it cannot be lost, it cannot be forgotten or stolen. And it is believed to be very hard to fake. Also in the past, we've seen numerous cases where this has been successfully done with very little effort. So if this is still a pro, it depends. A fingerprint can be very hard to fake if the uh, device is uh, configured to uh, recognize a lot of uh, small patterns in your fingerprint, the small curves and, and breakups here. And uh, the quality of a fingerprint very much depends on how many of these are taken to uh, identify a person. The downsides is that this usually needs some special hard and software at the control points, the points where you have to give your fingerprint or have your retina scanned or whatever. And of course, it's sometimes built in with your laptop or your mobile phone, at least a very simple fingerprint reader. Today's uh, mobile phones can even do some face recognition by the webcam on the front side. Um, but again, here quality depends very much on the software that is doing the actual face recognition behind the scenes. Correct detection of inherent properties is however a non-trivial task. So this can be a downside and we have to live with the point that we may have false positives. So somebody else fingerprint may actually be recognized as yours. Or we have also the point of a false negative. So you swipe your finger on the fingerprint reader and it doesn't recognize it. So this is, uh, uh, these are both cases that can happen, especially if you have for, for some reason, not so easily recognizable uh, fingerprints or whatever else. Compromised factors cannot be replaced easily. So if you, somebody copies your fingerprints, um, of course you can't just replace them. Um, so and after you've done, are through with all your 10 fingers, um, you have to resort to something else. So in, in high security applications, there has to be some special care taken that uh, somebody is, actually showing their own fingerprints or eyes or whatever at the uh, control points. And lastly, on the network, a biometric or other inherence pattern is not safer than any other factor. It's again, just a stream of bits, but this could also be said about passwords or tokens. So now the last term, what's the multi then here? Single factor is we just use one factor to authenticate. This is by 
far the most common form of authentication and the most common form of single knowledge factor authentication is typing in your password. Multi-factor authentication by the definition means that we use more than one factor to authenticate. Uh, to authenticate. Preferably, these should be at least two different kinds of the three I mentioned, so knowledge, possession, or inheritance. Why? I will talk about this in a moment. In practice, the multi could mean three or four factors, but in reality, this breaks down to two factors because we don't want to make uh, too much uh, cost and effort into this. And uh, most users uh, could probably not be uh, talked into giving uh, a password and a fingerprint and use a token. That would be probably a bit too much unless you have a very limited and very high security use case. So for the rest of this, this talk, uh, when we talk about multi-factor authentication, we mean two-factor authentication. So now what's wrong with a single-factor authentication? Well, nothing really wrong, but if even, even password authentication can be quite secure if you do it right. But if a single factor is broken or compromised, adversaries can get into the system. So a second factor would need an additional layer of protection. Okay, that's nice. So, but why is this a special concern with passwords? This is for a number of reasons. One of them is that the knowledge of the password can be forgotten. Okay, that's not the point. Uh, and a second factor wouldn't help here. It can be copied or guessed without the owner noticing. So that's uh, could be a problem with uh, passwords or knowledge factors. They have a long lifetime, month, sometimes even infinite. So if you're not forcing your users to change your passwords regularly, they can just log in for years and years without ever changing their passwords. It can be guessed quite easily, and we all have seen the cases where uh, the uh, number of uh, common passwords have been published. Two of the most common ones are one, two, three, four, five, six, or password. And uh, the last one that is actually exacerbating uh, the other downsides is that the same username and passwords are often used on multiple systems. So and this is especially true since we may mix enterprise and private accounts. So your Facebook or Gmail account or whatever else you have is also going by the same username or password uh, as you use for your university login. And this makes things a bit dangerous because there are numerous break-ins where adversaries have gotten hold of the password databases or user databases of uh, cloud services and uh, use them then later to uh, harvest uh, passwords and use these in attacks to uh, organizations and businesses. So, the consequence for us as universities and research institutions is that adversaries can usually get hold of at least one end user account name and password. And so they can use that password to log in there and then use this to laterally move to other systems or applications or escalate their privilege, uh, privileges to users with more rights. Usually that means admin on Windows or root on uh, Mac OS or Linux systems. So, and they can move on in this fashion until they get what's called the keys to the kingdom. So that's usually your Windows domain admins password or practically all important passwords 
in your organizations for your mail server, your storage server, your backup server, etc. And that's uh, when things usually get ugly because then we'll see typically the data exfiltration and ransomware attacks, spam, DDoS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's see a scenario that is usually shown to you to frighten you into buying multi-factor authentication. And it's not completely unrealistic. So what are sample ways of multi-factor authentication? A typical one is the photo ID batch. So you have the possession of the batch and additionally uh, your photo on it. So even if somebody steals that batch from you and tries to authenticate, the guard can still see that the photos don't match with your uh, with the face of the adversary and so they would not let, let people in. Another thing is uh, a cryptographic key on a hardware token. So when I mean cryptographic key, I mean SSH or X509 or PGP keys. So again, we have the possession of a token here and also the knowledge of the key or pin to unlock the key from the token. One could argue that it's basically knowledge because uh, it's still a soft key on the token, but these tokens are usually built in a way that you cannot copy the token away from the key, uh, fr uh, the key from the token uh, once it has been written to it. So, and uh, one final factor and the most common form today is used password plus a token one-time, token-based one-time password. So we have again, knowledge of the password and the possession of the one-time password generating token. This is the most common form of multi or two-factor authentication we'll encounter today. So, uh, Technically, it works by the client and the authentication backend sharing a secret. And uh, when you authenticate, once you've entered your password, the backend generates a one time password based on the secret and some additional information. And uh, then the software requests that one time password from you as the end user. Um, of course, uh, this is not transmitted to you. The one-time password is generated by your token when you press on it or when you unlock that multi-factor authentication application on your smartphone and uh, then see the uh, one-time password, perhaps with a little uh, time counter that tells you that this time, uh, password is still valid for some 20 seconds or so. If you have a very user-friendly form of uh, uh, multi-factor authentication token, you may just need to push a button on the smartphone or on your token. The YubiKey here has that button right there on the token. And uh, it will do all the uh, task of uh, typing in the one-time password without you ever seeing it. There are two methods technically for one-time password. One is called the hash-based uh, password or HMAC-based uh, one-time password. So it's a one-time password is based on a secret and a counter. This is well suited for offline systems or unreliable networks. However, uh, keeping the counters in sync can be a bit of a problem. So in reality, much more often used is a time-based one-time password, TOTP, which is based on the shared secret and the uh, date plus time of the day. So um, to work well, this requires uh, synchronized clocks between both parties. So something like network time protocol uh, working in between them. It doesn't need to be 
I'm matching it down to a single second, but uh, it should be with between four or five seconds to work uh, somewhat reliable. And that password is usually valid for a configurable uh, period of time, anywhere between usually 30 seconds and two minutes that uh, you have to yeah, get your phone out, unlock it, read the one-time password, and put it back in in the application. So the seconds can be a bit tight for that, but usually one minute is good enough. Many vendors pretend to support these, um, but in reality use a propriety variant of this. So watch out when you work with these or try to introduce these and uh, try to uh, get these uh, simultaneously on some uh, open source application and see if this is really just plain HTTP or THTP. So uh, however, uh, the proprietary variants may have uh, some additional convenience functions that may look uh, quite appealing to you. It depends a bit on what you want to do. Just um, be a bit wary here. So then we come to the use cases. Where should we use multi-factor authentication? One use case, for example, is remote maintenance. So all your vendors and uh, maintenance personnel that logs in from outside, you won't usually uh, have this a bit more secure because you may not trust them completely to keep the passwords safe and not pinned uh, somewhere on a board. Then a very common one is a login to your web applications, for example, your webmail or your campus portal or whatever else you have here. Another use case is authenticating to your local networks. That may be the wireless network or the VPN that you have. Local user login can be a bit tricky. I come to this in a couple of slides uh, on the topic of logouts. And of course, the administrator login. So when you shy away from having everybody use multi-factor authentication, a good case uh, to start is the administrator logins. So yes, uh, in an ideal world, we would use all of them and use them as soon as possible. Um, I may warn a bit against this. So each use case has its specific problems. So a solution that is tailor-made to each one of them is probably better meeting its ends. And uh, understanding all these specific problems in one project and addressing them equally well is a quite challenging task. And uh, your project may get a bit out of hand with uh, feature creep and uh, other things. So it's better to start with just one use case, understand it well and start there and then move on. Besides that, big projects have always the tendency to get out of hand, running over costs and budgets, getting bogged down with technical problems, taking too long, whatever else uh, may come on, uh, people leaving because of uh, moving their jobs and anything else. So uh, smaller proje uh, problem uh, projects have the tendency to finish uh, more likely on time and budget. So, Two things that are very critical with authentication problem uh, projects are user input. And uh, there are two user groups that we have to watch out. First one is the end users. Like it or not, their opinion and their, their buying into this uh, project is crucial to the success. So we have to involve them from the very first planning phase on. How would they like to solve 
the uh, password problem I've outlined. And we need to explain the needs and goals of the project. We have to train them how to use multi-factor authentication. And we have to get their feedback from them, how they like that specific solutions. And one thing that is really a, a don't is trying to force them uh, with a solution they don't like. And they don't like may just mean that they think it's cumbersome or just getting in the way. And end users have an amazing creativity in getting around security measures or what length they are willing to go just to avoid one specific thing they don't like. And being an administrator myself in the past, I can tell you that you will never match wits with them because they will easily outwit you. Not a single user, but as a whole, they will always outwit you. So get their buy-in, have them like your solution. Otherwise, it's not very likely that you will be successful. And the second user group is, of course, your administrators. They are the end users of the administrative tools of your multi-factor authentication, so to speak. And uh, using tokens or other possession factors generates more work than passwords. It's easy to set up an initial password and uh, have the user just uh, change it on a first login. And remember, on a fairly large university or research institutions, we may have hundreds or thousands of people appearing every semester at the start of the semester. So, so we have a big lump of work to do uh, at one or two given points uh, in time uh, every year. We have to deal with the task of revoking and replacing lost or damaged tokens. We have users, of course, leaving end users, staff members, students graduating. We have the day-to-day -day problems when things don't work. And one of the downsides of a multi-factor authentication is that we now have two factors that can go wrong. So the user has either forgotten his password or they have a problem with their token or their, pass, uh, their one time password application. So, uh, running into problems here is harder to debug, and uh, we need a lot of uh, experience and training, not only for using the tools, but also recognizing the common problems and attacks when things are uh, working in the uh, day to day operations. So uh, I would say that their opinion is about equally important to those of the end users. Again, they will show some creativity in either not implementing MFA at all in their uh, area because they will invent some reasons or pretty good excuses not to do so, or they will implement it in a way that generates less work however, is also likely going to be less secure. So some practical tips, um, use self-service platforms, usually web-based to ease the burden on the admins. So the users, for example, can enroll additional backup tokens, for example, another soft token on their smartphones for their logins or even uh, re uh, request a new token or uh, delete some old tokens or whatever. Physical presence should still be needed for identification of a user, at least the initial identification and the pickup of a new token. This is somewhat unavoidable, although the identification can be somewhat mitigated through video ident. I think we all know from the pandemic how to do this now. 
users will of course need to show some sort of photo ID and wiggle it a bit so you can recognize that they are actually using the a genuine photo ID and not some photocopied stuff. And uh, um, one another uh, tip would uh, to allow the use of already existing tokens that may already be present in some other areas, high performance computing or with maintenance personnel. So we don't have to force users into using three, four or more tokens uh, just to for different sorts of logins. And of course, this will require some open standard solution. So then it will also mean that switching the vendor of tokens is a bit easier. So uh, be wary of propriety uh, solutions or cloud-based solutions as they will usually lock in you to a very large degree. So, and uh, especially if tokens are forgotten or lost, allow and encourage secondary tokens, for example, on a smartphone. Another project management thing is, uh, don't forget that uh, a project has some paperwork attached to it. You need your security policies to be updated and your ISO or Grundschutz or whatever you have, documentations you have in your organization. Yes, privacy protection has also been considered. Who has access to the token data, especially when you have a cloud-based backend with some additional vendor? Where is that vendor located? United States? Ah, problem here, at least for Europeans. Logging, retention periods. And uh, a very nice one is also the point of... Uh, when you have a cloud-based supplier, what happens to all your user data, also all shared secrets, when you change that supplier? So you move from Google to Microsoft or to Apple or whatever. And of course, uh, you need a business recovery plan. If the worst case happens, even that may happen, your multi-factor authentication backend is compromised or somebody compromises the tokens you use. Yeah, think about it for a moment. Say you have are just a medium-sized university, so with something like 10 to 20,000 tokens in use by your end users, and you need to replace them. Just ask your vendor what happens if you order 20 or 10,000 tokens at once. And we need them tomorrow, please. So uh, even without the pandemic, you will probably run into a supply chain issue. So let's now come a bit to the uh, security part and user device security. So what happens about compromised laptops or PCs? which means what happens when we have an adversary that's on the system and has complete control over the operating system. So if we just keep a shared secret for a one-time password in memory, that would mean the second factor gets instantly broken in the same way as the password because the adversary could just read them from memory. So and that's the case why we have to keep the second factor on separate hardware and have the shared secret never leave these separate hardware and never have been on your PC or laptop in the first place. For smartphones or tablets as end devices, this is a bit more problematic because when I need, uh, when I use a soft token on that smartphone, my uh, security would be compromised in this way. So again, even here, uh, a secure way of using this would be a token with a near field communication interface, or you have a USB 
interface on your smartphone and yeah, they would have to plug in their token. Another thing is man in the middle attacks. So the adversary sits between the server you'd like to authenticate to and the client or end user system. So he pretends to be the other side to each one of them. So pretends to be the end user for the server and the server for the end user. And that means they can usually read the whole communication between them. One way of mitigating this would be to use a different communication link for the second factor. So the one pa uh, time password that used to be sent to you like through an SMS through the telephone network and the password was requested via the internet. Of course, on a converged network that doesn't work anymore. And of course it doesn't work with uh, mobile phones or other devices attached to the mobile phone network. So what we he need here is additional cryptographic protection against man in the middle attacks. So when you evaluate your solution, you may have to look into this. So, and uh, now for some of the pitfalls, what if the second factor is broken? So one of the things is that the user can't log in, of course. But um, the severeness of this may vary. So uh, what happens, for example, if the admin uh, can't log into servers and uh, fix the problem with the multi-factor authentication backend, for example, or if they uh, have something uh, broken in your Windows domain and your domain logins can't, uh, admins can't log in as domain administrators. So that's, um, yeah, we usually can do a password only based backup login at the physical console of the server. But uh, what about servers in the cloud? Do we have a backup solution here? Do we have some sort of console server that is uh, attached to a different kind of network? If I use password authentication here, yeah, wouldn't that somewhat circumvent the whole idea of admins uh, logging in only through a second factor? Yeah. Users that can't use uh, their VPN or web interfaces, especially to, for example, uh, request additional tokens or a new token. So they have to physically visit your campus to get the problem fixed. Again, being too lenient here may open avenues to identity theft, even despite of multi-factor authentication. There are other users, guest users or guest users of uh, high performance clusters that will sit maybe on another continent and will never come in physically to uh, get their tokens fixed or anything else. So this is a bit of a problem and this is where you have to visit your use cases very carefully and uh, discuss with your end users and security specialists uh, how you want to deal with that and uh, even with your uh, management if they accept the remaining risks. A similar problem happens when you enter too many wrong one-time passwords. So usually these things have a lockout after five or 10 failed attempts. Um, it depends a bit on the application if they give you a feedback that you are being locked out. I had this once uh, with the second factor authentication for my credit card and uh, the application not telling me that I was entering the wrong pin and uh, I was uh, of course running into a lockout and had to phone the emergency hotlines uh, until uh, we finally got this thing sorted out. It took me about a day. So one last pitfall is after you've successfully 
introduced multi-factor authentication, you slack off on password security. But at least we can use easily guessable passwords now. We have multi-factor authentication. Even if it's guessed, we don't uh, get an uh, immediate break in. Of course, the answer is no, because that would practically break the first authentication factor and we are back to single factor authentication, but this time just with a one-time password. And we still need to have hard to guess passwords. We can relax this a bit, but not too much. And a very strong point that I would underline is you still have to need different passwords on different accounts. And to manage this, I recommend using password managers. There are tokens around that uh, can be used as a password manager or can be used to unlock your password manager. This is a very nice functionality, um, makes the token a bit more expensive. So you have to look into your budget if you want to go with the uh, more expensive tokens here. And um, of course, uh, the uh, space for passwords on a token is a bit limited on older ones. So it's a couple of dozen usually. So, but at least uh, when we have good passwords and multi-factor authentication, are we secure then? Well, sort of. As security measures evolve, of course, so do the adversaries and they already have devised some sample attacks or attacks that are in use against multi-factor authentication. One particular uh, popular one is the fatigue attack, which just means we spam as adversaries, the user with so many one-time password requests that they finally prove one. And uh, because they can't recognize which one is genuine and which is just fake, and so the uh, adversary can get in. Another one is a social engineering attack against the organization's help desk. So when they have the user's password, they will take uh, the organization's admin or help desk and ask for a code to victim uh, verify the victim's activity. Sorry, it's a social engineering attack against uh, the end user by pretending to be the uh, help desk or admin. Uh, the code they will request for the uh, user's uh, victim's identifier LT is of course the one-time password. And one another thing is a cloning attack. Adversaries can transfer the user's phone number to another phone. This is usually uh, through a social engineering attack on the phone company to set up a new phone. Or simply by cloning the uh, phone because they gotten hold on it for some time. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for being with me for this time and I'm open for questions. Yeah, thank you Klaus for this uh, very interesting and clear presentation. Um, I don't see yet questions in the chat. Um, so if you have a question for Klaus, uh, this is your moment. So you can put it in the chat or either uh, raise your hand. Um, I don't see any questions at the moment, but... Um, all clear, that's nice. Um, I do have a question myself, maybe. Okay. So in a certain moment, you were talking about password managers. Um, um, I agree, it's very practical. I, I use it also at Belnet. Um, but I know that a lot of colleagues or people are not using it yet. So what would be your main tip or takeaway to encourage end users um, in general to use this kind of password managers? Yeah, it's it's a very good point to use a password manager, um, uh, even if you don't have multi-factor authentication. So uh, it 
tremendously helped me to get hold of all my password because you basically just need one master password for the uh, password manager. And each time I am prompted to generate a new account, I will just let the password manager randomly generate one password for me and uh, have this account together with the generated password uh, stored in my password manager. And uh, I also back up this uh, file, the database uh, to my cloud account. It's encrypted anyway. So uh, I don't have to worry about additional in, uh, encryption there. Uh, and uh, I can also always configure my password to do some sort of uh, automatic uh, form filling uh, with a password. So uh, in reality, it can get more convenient by just push, uh, putting on, uh, pushing on a button and have your uh, right password and username entered and uh, you don't have to remember any passwords at all. Mm -hmm. And I must say, uh, I have at least a couple of dozen passwords and I remember just two or three of them. Mm -hmm. So this helped me tremendously. Yeah, and I agree. <laughs> and you get very good mm -hmm. password managers as uh, open source. They don't cost you a thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see there are some questions uh, coming in. Um, so, uh, Marek Herbschritt is asking how to convince the management of university to act as a role model, uh, for example, by using 2FA and password managers. <laughs> well, <laughs> well. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 so, um, of course, it's it's nice to have them uh, start as a focus group, but again, uh, the point here would be the use case. Uh, having your management log in uh, through multi-factor authentication into what? Into their personal laptops? Eh, probably not the very best thing to start with. Uh, and if you have, for example, your web application or your say your finance application, this may be something that is critical enough to be uh, used at this point. Um, yeah, but of course, it's always good to start with the higher levels of management to have them as a, a role model and a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see it's adding that the use case is for supporting awareness within the institution. And yeah. I think a lot so of I, I see people now here, a couple um, of questions in the chat. I think I start with one from Gordon DeWitt. So a lot of organizations have rotating passwords. Um, would it be recommended to keep the mechanism in combination with multi-vector authentication? Well, rotating passwords are a thing of the past. Uh, I think the uh, most uh, recommendations from the government uh, today uh, are not longer requiring any regular change of passwords. If they are complex enough, uh, you don't need to change them. So you, yes, uh, especially with MFA, you can do away with it. But even without, uh, you are no longer required by uh, many governments to do this. Okay, then there's a question from Alex Peters as well. Yeah, if you were, uh, to, set if you were to set up a new multi-factor authentication environment, what technology would you use today? And also how would that system prevent users from being victimized by spear phishing attacks? Oh, that's a bit uh, tough to answer. I've shown you two things uh, uh, with multi-factors on tokens. One of them would be public private key uh, on a token or a one-time password. Personally, and here at DFN Cert, we use the uh, one with the certificate on the token, which is a bit more cumbersome to use, but that depends a bit on our environment here, but also has, of course, the uh, nice uh, side effect of rolling out public key encryption for use in email, uh, 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 with the same sweep. 
Uh, on the other hand, as features, I would very much recommend a multi-factor authentication that couples together uh, some more information uh, from where the login is, from when the login happened uh, and stuff like this to harden this a bit against phishing accounts so that you see when you see this coming in uh, that this is actually uh, from your application and uh, you are trying to log into. Uh, it's it's a bit uh, the same like a, a financial two-factor authentication that gives you also the uh, the uh, shop you're uh, buying from, the amount of money you are going to spend, and uh, whom do uh, you are going to spend this on. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend any password manager in particular? This is one from Christian Rower. Um, I personally use uh, KeyPass XC. Um, um, I can very much recommend the KeyPass family of software. It runs on practically every operating system and they usually receive top marks in the uh, security. I think the uh, Heiser magazine has done some uh, checks with a security of uh, password managers in the past. So for the German and even the English readers, this may be worth looking into. But uh, you can test these things even by yourself, just do a memory dump of your system and uh, see if you can find your password. If you can fast uh, find it in the memory of the password manager, throw it away. Not the password, the password manager. Um, so another one from Augustine Imperia. In a scenario where Fido2 is used as a shield from my MFA protocol, do you think it would make sense to share one key pair for web and SSH access? Or would it be better to have different case for each one? Nah. Depends a bit. It's, it's very hard to tell. Um, in generally, uh, if something breaks down, I tend to use uh, different keys for different areas of applications. So if one thing is compromised or even one backend is compromised, I will not run into problems here. Although this is not much of a problem with Fido too. So I hope uh, Stefan Schwer is asking a question. Are there good existing open solutions to or workflows to collect 2FA and to distribute them to different services? Such as self-service websites to so let's use inputs at public SSH keys and then use those in different services. Um, I think this is a bit difficult heating uh, the the uh, point here i know of one high performance uh site that uses a, s a system that goes into this direction but i think this is uh, they have self written it so um and i don't think that it does support anything else besides ssh keys and only a very specific uh, form of SSH keys. So I, I'm not aware of uh, such solutions. Again, uh, I think the uh, being happy with one solutions for all use cases is probably something that might not exist. So one more from John, uh, from from Johann de Berghey. Uh Is there any Fido web auth authentication available and software based, but using the trusted platform module on the machine, just to avoid the Fido two key management? <sighs> it's probably a good use case to use the TPM, but uh, I haven't seen anything like it yet. 
I know that on mobile phones, they use the uh, key store on the mobile phones. There are a couple of ones, but um, I'm not aware of uh, a open solution that at least uses the TPM. I think we can build one, but I wouldn't underestimate the things you may run into it with the uh, TPM on the laptops. So that may be another can of worms. I'm not sure if you actually gain something uh, from that solution. If you do not have your TPMs already set up and uh, managed already. So, and there's a, an announcement by Leonardo Marino. Yes, I think that was the last question. Um... I don't know if anyone wants to add something or um, if there are other questions. So, uh, yes, even if you have questions, you can probably uh, mail them to Davina or me and uh, or Davina will forward them to me and uh, contact me uh, anytime you want. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Um, so, yeah. so I think we can me. finish here today. Um, just uh, maybe to remind you that we have still two other webinars um, in the upcoming two weeks. Um, so next week we will welcome Melanie Volkamer from Sikusa. Um, so we haven't registered uh, yet. This is um, this is your chance. Um, and a last thing um, that's also important for us um, is your feedback, of course. So therefore, you will receive the link to a, a small uh, survey. Um, and we would be very happy if you could take uh, like one or two minutes to complete it. Uh, there are just uh, two or three small questions. Um, so I think we can close here for today. Um, Thank you, uh, Klaus, for your uh, interesting and very clear presentation. Um, thank you as well to our translators uh, today. And uh, thank you, of course, to all the participants. And uh, we hope to see you uh, next week. Bye. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. And bye. Bye. <laughs>